Hi, and welcome back to Small Caps. My name is Jess Fertig, and today we are catching up with ASX listed biotech Anatara Life Sciences. The ASX ticket code is ANR. So very interestingly, April this month is IBS Awareness Month. And so it's quite fitting that my guest today is the Executive Chair of Anatara Life Sciences, Dr. David Brooks. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Jess. So, David, Anatara is pioneering the development of evidence-based solutions for gastrointestinal diseases. Can you tell our audience a little bit more about Anatara and also, you know, what, what is the company trying to achieve? So, so I mean, obviously Anatara is a small small cap company. Now, now it has a focus predominantly on um, human health. Um, it did have a, a legacy of being involved with animal health projects, which um, which we haven't extinguished. And um, but the human health, with looking for evidence based solutions with a particular interest in gastroenterology, is uh, is the focus of the company, uh, and that's um, that focus is born out of the um, in house knowledge of activity around bromelain that came from those animal projects. And we've now incorporated into the, uh, GARP project. Um, and GARP is, um, it's just the in house name for gastrointestinal reprogramming project and the, and the, the, uh, complementary medicine that we, um, have designed and are trialing. Um, is referred to as GARP, but when we finish development and branding, of course, it will it, that won't be the name that's carried forward. So interesting, Dave. So we'll we'll get to GARP in a minute, but I wondered if you wouldn't mind just giving uh, our small caps audience just a brief overview about who's uh, involved in the company and touching a little bit on your experience as well. Okay, um, the. So, so the company obviously has gone through a transformation in the last couple of years um, as we try to, well, um, restructure and reestablish shareholder value. Um, I, I've, I took on the role as executive chair. I've, um, I've been involved with a number of uh, small cap listed companies over the years. Um, one I'm more well known for is um, RHS. Which um, which we sold to Perkinoma um, when Michelle Fraser was the CEO of that company here in Adelaide. Um, I, I'm on a number of other listed boards at the moment. My background is in as a procedural general practitioner who uh, started looking at biotech investments um, as an unofficial advisor or consultant, and that merged into being involved in boards and. Yeah, I've been involved for for more than twenty years now. Um, one of those boards um, I shared with John Michaelides, um, who I convinced uh, in the restructure to come and join me at Anatara. Um, uh, John is very well known in the uh, pharma world. He's um, has a has a lot of executive experience, um, having run a um, uh, a large uh, section of Roche for many years uh, overseas and and been the CEO of mid-tier successful pharma companies. Um, Mike West, is, who is one of the co-inventors of the GARP project, um, uh, has rejoined us um, uh, as the chief scientific officer recently. And, uh, and of course, Mike is well known throughout the biotech industry in Australia, um, having having had many role, many executive roles, either as a scientific officer or, or, or as a CEO. And then uh, Simon Erskine um, is our uh, chief development officer, and he's um, been tasked with coordinating uh, the GARP trial as well as finding new, uh, well as assisting in finding new projects. Um, and so the the trial sites are coordinated by Simon in conjunction with PPG, uh, Pro Pharma Group, who um, who are our contract-based uh, uh, organiser of the trial. Um, we're, we're a lean, a lean structure, um, and um, while, while we're Adelaide-based, we have an outsourced finance uh, team here. Um, we you know, in this day and age, it's easy enough to to coordinate and follow things up. Thanks so much, David. Now, 
And just shifting gears a little bit, congratulations, firstly, on completing the first stage of the trial for your IBS complementary medicine. Can you please share with our small caps audience some of the key findings from that trial um, and also discuss the significance of the improvement in symptoms that, that were observed? Okay, a broad, a broad brush there, Jess, but we'll we'll get through it. So <laughs> so stage one was um you know was very successful, achieved all the all the objectives and um and they were they were really simple. Um confirmed safety and tolerance, which we expected, and we'll get to what GARP is later, but we expected that because the components of GARP are all um, grass, so generally regarded, regarded as safe ingredients. Um, what what we were looking to um, to achieve was a you know statistically significant efficacy signal. What that means is, you know, was there an observed effect, and and you know, was it beyond doubt? Otherwise, um, you know, we would have abandoned the the trial right there and then. Um, pleasingly, um, the we we trialled a low dose and a high dose. The low dose was the actual dose predicted from all the preclinical work that had been done by the Anatara team uh, over a number of years, and um, so the both those doses showed a statistical benefit to the IBS sufferers in that. Um, at least a 50% reduction in the IBS triple S score um, was achieved with the with the low dose, which was the actual predicted dose, um, performing a little better than the high dose. And the high dose was in fact just double the predicted dose. So what does all that mean? So we, the thing to understand there is the IBS triple S score. Okay. So Irritable bowel syndrome doesn't have a biomarker. You can't have a blood test for it. There's not a measure for it. So the international convention is to score the patient's symptoms. And so um, the IBS is obviously irritable bowel syndrome and the triple S is severity scoring system. And so what, what, what does that mean? So to, to be classified with IBS, you have to have suffered for more than six months from symptoms so it has to be long-standing and it's got a, there's a number of criteria to meet and you, you need to have those symptoms at least one day a week um and and meet a, uh, a score on that ibs triple s which is a maximum of 500 and it's actually very simple to understand and 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 in understanding it i think it gives a great insight into what someone suffering from IBS goes through. So the, the five things that are scored are, are pain and the and they have to score uh, in the trial each seven days, but um, for the IBS triple S, it's over 10 days, how frequently has it occurred? Um, so pain, distension, interference with uh, lifestyle, um, inconvenience from bowel action, uh, other other predominant features. So it's it's the pain and the distension, um, and then the interference from the uncertainty about bowel actions, which can be diarrhea or constipation. And remembering this, these have to occur at least once a week. Now, if you get to get in our trial, you have to be moderate to moderately severe, a moderate to moderately severe sufferer which means that your score has to be between 175 to 350. If you're scoring each of those five components up to 100, you can quickly see that someone who gets in the trial is, you know, every other day having uh, pain, distension, uncertainty about their bowel habit, um, interference with their quality of life because of those features. Mm -hmm. And so to have... Um, have a trial result where where those symptoms were reduced so improved by more than 50 percent um what was a was a staggering outcome um and one which our you know very independent advisory board of of uh, gastroenterological luminaries um you know thought it was a um a massive fillip to continue with with the program so the 
the discussion we had with the advisory board included that with gastroenterology um, studies, it's not unusual to have a placebo effect, and we expected that, and that was observed in the GARP trial. But both the low and the high dose outperformed the placebo effect by 20%, um, which which is a clear signal that you know potentially this this can be a, a breakthrough treatment um, for IBS sufferers in in the near future. That's great. Thank you so much, Dave. And, and also just really appreciate you simplifying all of this for our non-medical listeners, including myself. Um, so just moving forward with GARP, you, you've mentioned GARP. Can you please, for our small caps audience, in very simple, in very simple terms, um, explain to us what GARP is and how it works? Yeah, it's I think the, the best way to approach that is to give the audience an understanding of um, the pathophysiology, if you like, to use a medical term, of irritable bowel syndrome. And then, then I think it's clear to understand why GARP was designed as it has been and, and how it works. <clears throat> so irritable bowel syndrome has always been um, thought to be um, a functional uh, condition, which means that it's, that it's real, though it's not determined exactly you know what what contributes to the symptoms and the process the patient suffers is it's always been known that gut hypersensitivity and abnormal motility were factors and issues as were overlying and complex psychological feedback mm -hmm. but what's be, what's become really clear in recent times is is that low grade inflammation increased permeability or leaking in the gut wall and disruption or dysfunction of the microbiome clearly contribute to irritable bowel syndrome. And, and, and so if you understand all those components and think about that, what do you want from a product? Well, you want something that can restore and maintain the gut lining and assist the, the well-being or homeostasis is the term we use of, of the microbiome. And so GARP was delivered, designed to deliver five specific ingredients with a purpose to different zones of the intestinal tract. And, and it's not unusual to have enteric coating, which is the uh, first coating that all of the five ingredients have. And, and, that, um, and then three components have additional polymer coating, so they get through not just past the stomach, which is the enteric coated part, into the small intestine, but they get, they're not dissolved. They don't become food. They get into the lower part of the small intestine into the large colon. Now, normally those three components, and we'll, we'll deal with those first, which are vitamin D, butyrate, and threonine, uh, would be digested before then and, and, and are not normally um, delivered into the large intestine. Once they are delivered in that specific area, they they have they they uh, assist functions that um, are required for for cell synthesis and the well being of the of the surface of the lining and the junctions between the cells. Um, as well, butyrate is is seen as a uh, a beneficial or a super super a food source for some of the more beneficial species of the of the microbiome. The the two ingredients that don't get to the large intestine that have come through the stomach are menthol and um, bromelain. And the the menthol is there, which is just a well-known um, relaxant to, to help with you know, abnormal uh, motility and spasm. And that's sort of there because we could. The, you know, um, the bromelain is, is, the, is, is, is important. Um, as it has, bromelain has dozens of proteases, which are enzymes that that have have roles, which is why it's been used in food production and it's been used in complementary medicine for 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 many years for to to try and use that, those features. Of course, they're usually destroyed by the time they're in the stomach. So that's the enteric coating allows them to get into the small intestine, and similarly to what the ingredients that have gone that go on to the large bowel 
it assists in the in the um, in reducing inflammation and supporting the maintenance and the surface of the small intestinal gut lining through those through that enzymatic activity. Um, Anatara has a specific knowledge that goes back to all the animal work that was done about what proteases matter and what are effective. Um, and while there's dozens of them, we do a, a you know, quality assurance process really looking at there's there's only half a dozen that we're particularly interested in to benefit um, the intestinal tract. So so very simply, we, we're trying to restore and maintain the gut lining. We're trying to assist um, the well-being of the microbiome and and in doing those things and ensuring that the gut as a barrier is performing normally and not leaking, then you don't get into that situation where metabolites from the microbiome or from digestion cross the the uh, gut wall into the blood and then affect the, the gut brain axis, which is a whole other topic. And uh, a lot of those are covered in our in our company presentations if if people want to look at more specific um, uh, aspects of what each component does in the mechanism of action and then and what the gut brain axis is. But um, so again, if you go back to the results and look at the charts from stage one, we're really encouraged by not just the improvement in, in the patient's symptoms in the first two or three weeks, so that improvement in the IBS triple S, but that it's maintained, it stays down, which which to us was saying, you know, the mechanism of action appears to be supported by the evidence that that we that the 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 participants have had relief. And they're not getting little bursts of activity. The the maintenance appears to be occurring. So um, it, it really it really has encouraged us. And and we move on to stage two, looking to you know uh, secure the validation around that information, um, be, because ultimately twenty participants in each group um, is is helpful, um, but we, you need bigger numbers to convince my medical colleagues. Um, and also from the from the primary endpoint point of view, we, we want to achieve a P-score of less than 0.05. We're not far away from that. Uh, powering, as you probably know from trials, is is about numbers and design. And so we need, we need more numbers to get there. Now, interestingly, on the secondary endpoints, um, such as anxiety and depression, um, we achieve statistical significance in that small population of of, of twenty, um, and again that didn't um, didn't surprise us because if you improve your IBS and you're not worrying about it, then presumably background um, distraction um, anxiety should improve with it and. But we'd like to think that um, there's a direct and indirect effect, and the the mechanism of action positively affecting the influence of uh, the gut brain axis, um, you know, potentially is, is a factor there as well as 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 is the direct relief from symptoms. That is so incredibly interesting, David. And I, I mean, I'm not a medical professional, but um, I think I've read somewhere that uh, quite a large percentage of serotonin is is actually created within your gut bacteria. So that's or your microbiome. So there's it's not surprising, I suppose, that there would be those sort of um, outcomes in terms of mental health um, anxiety. Well, the, uh, the 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 gut brain axis is incredibly complicated it's mm -hmm. you know the bi-directional relationship um has many many factors um it, it, you know the the gut wall itself makes serotonin there's, there's so there's neuroendocrine factors there's all those metabolites from the microbiome uh, incredibly complex but relevant topic um you know and uh, and of course we've known we've known for a long time in mainstream medicine, that the microbiome affects the immune system, uh, not a topic for today. No. Um, so we're, we're we're not a microbiome company. Um, we're we're a company that 
understands how important it is and and how important the the um, lining of the gut as a barrier is in is in overall health. And there are really no other products around uh, for the restoration and maintenance of the gut lining. Yeah, we're, we're hoping gut will um, emerge with you know undisputed evidence um, that it, that it assists that. You've had a very important milestone this week, um, specifically in relation to the commencement of recruitment for your stage two clinical trial, which you've just mentioned. Can you just briefly explain to our listeners, you know, what your research team will be focusing on for that trial? So the it's it's the it's important everyone understands it's still the same phase two trial. We did stage one to pick the dose the optimal dose to take into stage two. And stage two was all about establishing the numbers for that powering that we've talked about. So that whoever in the scientific or the clinical world, you know, picks up the information about it, we've got enough patients in the in the trial group and we've got a P-score that, you know, it, it, it says in undisputed uh, terms that, that this is not a fluke. This this is this is actually doing something, and um, uh, that's that's what we're aiming aiming to achieve. That the the stage two trial has been met with a lot of enthusiasm, uh, with uh, you know potential participants expressing interest, and um, you know we're, we're very hopeful that we can well we can get that done in a, in a much more efficient manner than stage one, which was COVID disrupted and we had to modify the trial. Um, inclusion exclusion criteria um, to make it more workable and um, all of that was um, a very painful process for our shareholders um, but um, we we feel that we've 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 got it um, uh, you know refined and 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 the same group who assisted finishing off um, stage one with us um, PPG and the, and and the Royal Melbourne are involved and we've got some new new trial sites um so with an additional one to melbourne to, to the royal melbourne out at sunshine two in sydney and one in brisbane they're all available just going to the anatara life sciences website uh, there's a ready link there for people if they want to express their interest if they live in any of those uh, cities brilliant thank you so much david now before we go i just very curious so being that it's um, IBS Awareness Month this month. Can you just sort of give our audience, you know, some of the statistics and, and key numbers here? Uh, for example, you know, how many Australians actually suffer from IBS? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, look, it's really simple. Um, it's, there's no doubt internationally, the prevalence in the first world would be described as, as at least 10% across the population. So that's across the population. In the adult population, in, in Australia, studies are, uh, you, you can find the study that you want that, that supports 20 or even up to 30% of adults uh, suffer from IVS at, at some point. So so it, it it's a very common problem. Everyone knows someone who suffers from IBS. Um, and um, it's the ratio is two to one uh, females to males, so it's more common in women. And and the the you know part of the reason we persisted with the GARP project when we we're rationalising everything at Anatara a couple of years ago was um, you know a, a belief that as a project that could make a difference. And one of the statistics that's really compelling is from a major study done in the United States by the NIH. So it's a quality survey of more than 3,000 sufferers and 300 specialists treating people with the more severe forms of IBS. Less than 20% of IBS sufferers are satisfied with their prescription and or their over-the-counter medication, which means that 80% of IBS sufferers are still out there looking for something. And, you know, the, they when we say they're satisfied, they're, they're, they're not getting um, a therapy or a treatment which relieves and maintains the gut wall, as we are hoping to do with GARP, to give them, to normalise the quality of life. They're just getting something, 
you know, something to modify the pain if that's the main feature, something to modify the diarrhea if that's the feature, something to modify the constipation. So their their treatments are are, are, are symptom uh, focused, whereas we'd like to think we're assisting the symptoms and addressing the process. That is so interesting, David, and and actually quite remarkable how prolific. IBS is and how prolific this problem is um, in Australia, as you've just mentioned, um, and and definitely worth finding a solution rather than just sort of masking the symptoms um, as what Anatara is, is trying to achieve. We're very hopeful, and um, as I say, there's there's um, there's belief, um, it, you know, um, driving the enthusiasm of stage two, and we're planning for success. So. Uh, we'll, um, we're looking forward to getting stage two done and the results out, um, you know, within, within the next four to five months. Oh, fantastic, David. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so interesting to hear about, uh, the company and really look forward to watching Anatara as it progresses stage two and hope to have you back on the show very soon. Okay. Thank you very much, Jess.